In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A fragrant offering. A fragrant offering. Everyone is blessed when love propels the gift. Everyone is blessed when love propels the gift. There's a scene in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Interestingly enough, when it came out, uh, it didn't do very well. The country really wasn't interested in another movie reflecting on World War II. But of course, it's a classic that's played on television and different streaming services every Christmas. And there's one scene where George Bailey, one of the main characters, played by Jimmy Stewart, is about to commit suicide. He's on the bridge and he's looking down at the turbulent waters. And all of a sudden, this other person jumps into the water. We find out later it's Clarence the angel. And he's an angel third class because he hasn't gotten his wings. He's not super impressive. But he decides he's going to jump into the, to the river because he knew George, and he knew George would try to save him, and he did. And so they're sitting in this uh, room with the uh, person who oversaw the bridge, and they're sitting there next to the, to the stove, warming up, and uh, they have a little conversation. And they're talking uh, back and forth, and George Bailey says to the angel, Clarence, you wouldn't happen to have 8,000 bucks, would you? And Clarence goes, oh, no, 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 no. We don't use money in heaven. And George Bailey's response was, well, it comes in pretty handy down here, bub. And as you remember the story, uh, George's uncle had absentmindedly given away the 8,000 instead of depositing it, and they were looking at some very serious issues. Whether we like it or not, how we use the monetary blessings given to us by the Lord and why we use them the way we do matters. Reflecting on our wealth or the lack of it gets to the heart of who we are, what we trust, and the risk that's involved whenever we give it away. Today, we're looking at Paul's declaration that everyone is blessed when love propels the gift. We're finishing our series in the book of Philippians. I hope it's been a blessing to you. It's certainly been a blessing to me. And as we look at this, and before he gives his final greetings, he wants to thank them and return to uh, what he had said a little bit in chapter 1 about how they had blessed him. And starting in verse 10, we, as was read by Lynn today, Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly now that at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were confirmed, concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. And he goes on and talks about the monetary gift that was brought by Epaphroditus. And Lynn, you did a fine job trying to say that name. You hang in there. That's not an easy one. But he starts out again with our Phrase, the phrase he repeats over and over and over and over in Philippians. I rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Have joy, have joy. And Paul here gives us yet another key, the word and spirit, that can unlock peace and joy for us. And that is don't put our trust in our monetary blessings from him, but put our trust in him. Listen to what he says in verse 14. He says, he rejoiced because you've revived your concern and they had blessed him. And then in verse 14, he says, in any case, it was kind of you to share in my distress. This gift that had come from Epaphroditus was a time when he was in need. And they gave to him and the motivation that they have is a concern for him, you revived your concern for me, and you shared in my distress. And he's thanking them. 
Their motivation for Paul here was not because Paul was browbeating them or trying to get money out of them, but because they were truly concerned for Paul. And we're going to see that uh, reconfirmed as we go through our text today. Often fundraising in the church encourages us and tempts us not to be motivated by love, but to be motivated by a host of other things. I remember in the past Anglican province that I was in, one of the people who was uh, in print talking about the next archbishop who would be elected is, it's going to be very important that this archbishop be a fundraiser because we really need to get some money going on here. And I just remember how much that grieved me. Now, is there anything wrong with fundraising per se? No. Is there anything wrong... Matter of fact, there's certainly something right with communicating to the church community that there is a need, yes. But how we communicate and what we want the motivations of the people of God to be is not guilt and shame and coercion or, well, I might as well do this and maybe it'll give me some standing in the church, but a motivation of love for God and for each other. The bottom line is that when we do any kind of stewardship campaign, the absolute force behind it should be that God does not need our money, but he chooses to bless us and use the money that he's given to his people. He doesn't need our assistance. He's not up there wringing his hands, hoping that St. Matthews can pay their bills. But our reflection in how we use our money can represent the softness or even the hardness or fear of our hearts. We give out of hearts that are glad to do it or if we're faking it so we can make it because we love our God and love people and want to have the right motivations. Secondly, commitment through Christ, verse 11. Paul says, you were concerned for me and you gave, you didn't have an opportunity beforehand. He was likely not in that region. And not that I'm referring to being in need, for I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little. I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and going hungry, of having plenty and being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind for you to share in my distress. Paul is likely here being accused by some of the people he talked about in the first chapter that Paul's trying to make money off of his ministry. He's not in it to love. And in the past, we don't, you don't see this in the context, but he had gone to the, the churches in Macedonia, including the Philippians, and he was trying to raise money for the famine in Jerusalem and in other places where there were people who were starving in the church and he was going around to the different churches trying to raise money for that and now his detractors are likely trying to stick it to him oh he raised that money all right but he raised it for himself and he's letting them know no I'm not raising this money because I don't believe God can take care of me I'm raising this or I asked you for this help because I'm trying to be a servant of God and a good steward And he'd learn what? Contentment. Can you buy contentment? This is the problem with being wealthy and making your fortune and then having kids. And you can read story after story and documentary and documentary. It's terribly hard not to spoil kids who have everything given to them. And they grow up to be adult children. And why would they be so entitled and miserable? Because contentment doesn't come from being rich. Contentment is a matter of the heart. Everyone is blessed when love propels the gift. Thirdly, Paul says it's an act of worship. The giving you've given to me and to others. Look in verse 15. You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except for you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent, me, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that ac- accumulates to your account. 
I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I am fully satisfied. Now that I have received from Aphrodite the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. What he's talking about is that when he was in different parts of Macedonia, because of the way the Roman people would think about the patron system, and we've talked about this before, he chose not to be paid by them so as to be seen as an equal, not their worker. They were not developed in their understanding. Some of them were newer bodies in Christ, or some of them were troubled bodies in Christ. So whatever the case is, he is choosing and had to rely on people like the Philippians to, pay, to, to fulfill his needs. They also allowed him, he was a tent maker, they also allowed him more freedom to be able to preach and use his gifts instead of being making tents so that the gospel could go forward more effectively. But he says to them, your giving to me and to these causes, they're about the kingdom of God. Raise up to God like a sacrifice on a Jewish altar of sweet incense. It's that incense that we hopefully can reflect and be pointed toward when we have incense in our worship. It's, it's something we're worshiping God with the beauty and the smells of who he is and we're offering up everything that we have of our senses and self and saying that we love God. And Paul's saying, your giving was motivated by love and what you have done worships and blesses even our God. And then finally, he says to them, that those that are giving are actually receiving. The giving that receives. Look in verse 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. And then skipping down in verse 19 and 20. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And look what he finishes with. To our God be Father and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul talks about in the first chapter the fruit of righteousness that's evidenced in their lives. The work of the Spirit that is among them. Their progress and faith has been evidenced by the way they have lived and that has included their giving. And then in first. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, actually I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he talks about this idea of the things we've done before God come before at the end of our life where it is seen that we have truly followed him. And he's not trying to say, hey, you got good rewards coming. That's not the focus. The focus is be encouraged. I know you're suffering, but what you're doing matters and God cares about them. Not that it earns us a salvation. It should be the fruit of a transformed life. Our giving is to be directly, is, is and will be directly related to our spiritual condition. Why we give is as important as the gift itself. And this is what often discourages me about the way churches and clergy raise money. You can raise a lot of money in the short term. But in the long term, how we raise that money can close off the power of the Spirit and our witness that only comes from the change and love of character and opens up through the Holy Spirit to the world a people that are truly odd for the right reasons. But instead, and one of the reasons I believe the church is in decline, we have taken the world's way of getting things done. Hobnob with the rich. Get them involved because they can build you some beautiful... And there's nothing wrong in and of itself of being wealthy. What is wrong is putting your hope in wealth, whether you're a clergy or a layperson. When I approach someone who is wealthy in my church, because there's some need that I see, I'm not just thinking about the church or my own career or how we'll be perceived in the community. I'm thinking of this person's soul. Remember Jesus when the rich young ruler came to him? The rich young ruler, he had a lot of money. He's coming to Jesus. Master, he says, I mean, if Jesus was like a lot of our clergy today, he'd be like, whoa, this guy's an important dude. How can I encourage him in the Lord? 
keep him around. And I've seen this done on staff at various big churches. But no, he was concerned about that young man's condition. He goes, oh yeah, I know you think you've kept all this. You think you're good. But here's your problem. I know your heart. Go and sell everything you have. That's the dumbest fundraising move in history. Because what was Christ concerned about? He was concerned about that person, not what he could get from them. And that communicates to people. It sends a message. Here at St. Matthew's, we will have times where we make you aware of needs. We will have, and God has blessed us with an, some endowments, and that's great. But it can also be something that we put our hope in, and it can also be something that makes us say, hey, I don't really need to be a part of this in giving. I mean, we have these endowments, we have these things. And then we miss the blessing of being a part of what God wants to do here as we continue to reach out in the kingdom of God. We miss the benefit and joy of that giving and contentment that's a part of being the people of God because we love him and love the people. But we leaders also need to reflect that we're not parasitic. We're not wanting to see the church grow so that we can be bolstered in our own selves. And that kind of respect must be earned, not just talked about. Everyone is blessed when love propels the gift. The motivation behind using our financial resources should be our genuine love for the Lord and those it blesses. The growth in our systematic giving to the Lord enables us to find our contentment in the right things, thus paving the way for joy. In the end, the sacrifice of sweet incense before the Lord gives as much to the giver in both joy and spiritual reward as it does to those who receive it in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.